William Ambrose Holbert formed the National League in 1876, and upon the league's inception, quickly realized that a stable structure and franchise was imperative in order to attract and maintain a solid base of loyal fans. Additionally, he recognized that player salaries were undoubtedly the greatest cost for each respective franchise within the league. So, with a kill two birds with one stone approach, Holbert declared that each team would be able to reserve five players of their choice from the current roster. For these select athletes, this essentially meant that they would have no say in negotiating any salary or contractual details as the owners now possessed any and all leverage, power, and influence. By 1883, the reserve system had expanded to now include 11 players, which practically constituted the entire Major League roster. Owners quite literally owned their players now, as every reserved athlete lost the ability to negotiate with other teams, which effectively eliminated any semblance of an open market. At one point, Monty Ward, a disgruntled player, decided to form what became known as the Players League, and while it showed some promise initially, the National League's owners used both societal and economic resources to eventually will the Players League into submission. This attempt was ultimately the first of many to loosen the National League's grasp on the world of baseball and everything within it. The Federal League was the last ditch effort for establishing a rival competitor to the American League and National League. After all previous attempts valiantly failed, the owners offered signing bonuses and less restrictive labor policies as a means of seducing players away from Major League Baseball. Although the Federal League was somewhat successful in ultimately stealing some players away, the extremely wealthy owners of Major League Baseball effectively bought out each Federal League team, taking their players and more importantly, disabling the apparent opposition. In the end, all but one Federal League team was bought by a Major League counterpart, a team located in Baltimore. This owner, however, claimed that this was a violation of the newly established Sherman Antitrust Laws, which effectively prohibited monopolies. By eliminating their competition, Major League Baseball had essentially made themselves the sole gatekeeper of baseball within the United States, re-establishing a monopoly-like dynamic. After the owner of the Baltimore Federal League team had initially been rewarded a troubled sum, an appeal that eventually made its way to the Supreme Court ended up ruling that this in fact was not a violation of antitrust laws largely referencing a lack of interstate commerce being involved as the rationale. This was crucial in establishing for future decades the precedent of a monopoly externally and a monopsony internally in relation to being able to reserve their athletes without consequence. Decades later, in the 1950s, a minor leaguer named George Toulson of the Newark Bears, a minor league affiliate of the New York Yankees, claimed that his inability to pitch for a major league baseball team was a direct violation of antitrust laws. Toulson stated that he was trapped in the minor leagues because he simply lacked the power to negotiate with other teams and that it in no way was a reflection of his skill or actual potential value. With the Yankees already possessing elite pitching at the major league level, it made Toulson a luxury who they were fine to let dwell in the minors until needed. Unfortunately, the federal baseball ruling was in fact upheld when applied to the Toulson case, and the effort to overturn the oppressive reserve system was yet again unsuccessful. Twenty years after Toulson in 1972, Kurt Flood took the commissioner of Major League Baseball to court after he had refused a trade that would have sent him to the Philadelphia Phillies. Flood had his entire life, family, and other business ventures all stationed comfortably in St. Louis, and a sudden move with no say in his destination 
was the last thing he wanted. I often wondered what I would do if I were ever traded, because it happened many, many times, and it was a part of the game. And then suddenly, it happened to me. I was leaving probably one of the greatest organizations in the world, to at the time what was probably the least liked. And by God, this is America, and I am a human being. I am not a piece of property. I am not a consignment of goods. Kurt Flood, 1994. Since the infinite re-up on the last year of a player's contract is the nucleus of the reserve clause, Flood claimed that this structure kept him from ever negotiating with other teams. Although Flood was unsuccessful in his attempt to overturn the precedents and conditions within the federal baseball ruling, there was a key victory that was birthed from this case. Baseball, for the first time ever, was recognized as possessing interstate commerce, and this development eventually led to the destruction of the reserve system and establishment of free agency down the road. Throughout the years, Federal Baseball, Toulson, and Flood had all attempted to abolish the reserve system within Major League Baseball with little success. But now entered a man destined to spark change. Marvin Miller is the founding father and original advocate for grievance arbitration becoming a core element within Major League Baseball and its collective bargaining agreement. A once prominent leader within the United States Steelworkers Union, Miller eventually got the opportunity to become president of the Major League Baseball Players Association. Ownership and management can do anything they want with regard to your terms and conditions of employment or firing you or not hiring you. Anything they want that's not forbidden by law. There is no law that says I can't hold on to you, I can't, uh, I can't uh, send you back to the miners if I don't like the way you talk, uh, etc., etc. Miller fought tirelessly to help gain the athletes more rights and freedoms with each ensuing CBA agreement. Victories such as, in his first negotiations in 1968, achieved a formal grievance procedure and increased the league-wide minimum salary showcasing right away. Miller's willingness to fight for the players. Two years later, in 1970, Miller gained recognition as the sole collective bargaining agent for all players, while also establishing a grievance arbitration procedure maintained by a neutral third-party candidate. Andy Messersmith came along after his absolutely stellar 19-win season in 1974 and the floor was suddenly set for a potential battle for once and for all demolish the reserve clause. Upon completion of the 1974 season, Messersmith desired a substantial raise from what he had made the previous season. As one of the top pitchers in the game, Messersmith knew that he was a valuable commodity and wanted to be compensated accordingly. Unfortunately, Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley had other plans, as he countered with only a modest proposal and pay bump for Messersmith. So, using his new grievance arbitration ability, Messersmith was ready to take Major League Baseball to court. Miller and Messersmith claimed that within the reserve clause, the option to re-up a player's contract for one year on the same terms only in fact applied to the first year post-completion of the original contract and not with the indefinite status with which the owners had become accustomed to. Enter Peter Seitz, a well-respected arbitrator who was appointed as the third-party arbitrator for Major League Baseball and the Players Association during the stretch of time under the CBA, making him the overseer of this Messersmith grievance. While Major League Baseball and the owners were confident in their ability to win the case, 
they ideally still wanted to keep the case from ever reaching the courtroom to ensure there was no possible way for them to lose. Major League Baseball even claimed that this case was not valid because grievance arbitration is explicitly stated to only concern measures included within the CBA, and the reserve system was deemed to not be included within its confines. However, the CBA did include several provisions that clearly reference the reserve system and quite literally establish its precedent. After several similar efforts by Major League Baseball to debunk Messersmith's case and a rather lengthy trial, Sates ultimately ended up ruling that any effort to perpetually renew a player's contract must be explicit in its definition, and that more importantly, a team can only reserve a player that is in fact under contract. And since Messersmith played the previous season, under the reserve clause and not an agreed upon deal, he couldn't be retained for another season under those identical terms. This effectively ended the reign of the reserve clause in professional baseball. The owners promptly fired sites and appealed the decision to no avail. Out of good faith and the intention to still possess some sort of contractual stability and structure, the MLBPA and owners eventually reached a compromise where a team could reserve a player for six years before he had the right to declare free agency. By splitting free agency up in this way, players and teams both potentially benefited because the franchises now had relatively cheap control over their younger talent and players ultimately got the crown jewel, free agency while spacing out free agency to an interval where the market is not oversaturated on a year-to-year -year basis, allowing more competition to develop for a player's signing price. So although one can make the case that any of Marvin Miller's persistence, Andy Messersmith's gall, or Peter Seitz's open-mindedness were the main catalyst in ending the reserve system, I believe it's quite clear that it was a strong collaborative effort between all three that helped to create a unified and determined effort to crack down on decades of oppression. One of the most curious aspects of this long journey to free agency for Major League Baseball players was in fact the recognition of Major League Baseball now possessing interstate commerce under the Curt Flood ruling. How was it possible that only a few years earlier, this was not found to be undeniably obvious with the Toulson case? Well, this has nothing to do with who Flood or Toulson were as players, and everything to do with the rise of broadcasting and media that was about to revolutionize the entire structure of Major League Baseball. For much of the first half of the 20th century, most cars didn't have their own built-in radios. It was seen as a luxury component and that widely changed throughout the following decades when that number climbed to around 50% in the 1960s and by the mid-1970s more than 95% of cars had them. Major League Baseball owners and executives alike started to realize the power of media. A similar trend existed with TV sets as well, for in the late 1940s, only around 10% of US households had TV receivers, but by 1960 that skyrocketed all the way to more than 85%, which cannot be categorized in any other way than constituting an explosive amount of growth. Now, also starting in the year 1960, Major League Baseball saw its revenue grow by an astonishing 17% rate annually till 1990. Along those same lines, once free agency was established, players saw their value mirror a similar spike as the average player salary was $35,000 in 1973 and had climbed all the way to around $1 million by 1992. But you might be wondering, what was the major catalyst for enabling the sort of massive growth within the sports media world? Well, you might be surprised to find out. The answer is actually beer. 
The beer battles of the 70s led all professional sports down a lucrative rabbit hole of endless levels of profit. Anheuser-Busch and Miller were in a bitter feud for supremacy of the US beer market and quickly realized that their best bet of reaching consumers was through sports programming. Each company was more than willing to spend upwards of two-thirds of their entire ad budgets on sports programming. And as such, these networks now had no problem handing over massive contracts to Major League Baseball. TV money and other revenue streams allowed the MLB to triple their revenue to over $600 million by 1984, an amount of exponential growth many couldn't fathom in their wildest dreams a mere decades ago. Fast forward to 2020, and Major League Baseball is on track to make a ridiculous $2 billion plus dollars a year from their future national TV deals. Their new long-term deal with Turner Sports, for example, approximates to $3.29 billion over the life of the contract, or $470 million annually. That massive sum will be accompanied by a Fox Sports contract, that will pay $729 million per year over the life of the deal, and a new deal with ESPN that should be in the ballpark of $850 million annually as well. Although local market revenues can vary greatly based on the popularity of an individual franchise, the overall growth during this time is truly remarkable. There's no doubt that media and baseball now obviously includes social media under its broader umbrella. Players have gone from incognito average Joes during most of the first half of the 20th century to now being highly marketable personal brands and influencers. When looking at great players such as New York Yankee Aaron Judge, his 1.2 million Instagram followers are a reflection of what can happen when the perfect storm of skill, marketability, and playing in a large sports market occurs for an athlete in the modern day. While social media has led to marketing and advertising opportunities for many athletes that in some cases even match their playing salaries, owners in some contexts are still unwilling to pay athletes what they're worth as this new total package. With the COVID-19 shortened season of 2020, where does this leave us going forward? If fans aren't allowed to attend games in 2021, how much will it affect team revenue and salaries within the short term? Even with the amount of progress that has been made over the past 50 years for the players, many questions unfortunately murky the water and perhaps will enable owners to diminish some of the gains achieved by the athletes. When looking at the 2020 deal proposed by the owners earlier this past May as a compromise in order to start the season amidst the pandemic, it became abundantly clear that this power dynamic still rests on unequal shoulders. When tasked with offering a proposal for starting the season during this hectic and difficult time, Major League Baseball ultimately offered and was intent on sticking with a 50-50 split with the players in terms of salaries and revenue. When taking into account the $10.5 billion made by Major League Baseball in 2019, a 50-50 split in this context ultimately leads to some utterly shocking results that correlate to a roughly 50% reduction in salaries across the league for all players. Social media and the overall media landscape has revolutionized the sports and baseball worlds by cultivating revenue growth at mammoth levels. And yet, the athletes themselves and their salaries are constantly the primary target in any circumstance that requires the slashing of costs. While the rise of broadcasting and media 
has forever changed the economic potential of Major League Baseball into the billions of dollars. It's also quite evident that players still need to ensure their voices are strong and ready to fight back when needed.